Proverbs chapter 24. Be not. That's simple. Be not. Be thou not envious. Envy is when, you know, somebody else got something. You don't. You're not getting the attention. You're not getting something. Be not envious against evil men. So when there's somebody who's not saved, somebody who's not of the Lord, and they're getting, and they're being pleased, and they're, get your eyes, get your thoughts off them. Neither desire to be with them. Don't, listen, that's the same thing Paul tells the Christian in, <clears throat> in Corinthians. We're to separate ourselves. What is the church and the Christian doing fellowshipping with evil people? What is the church doing? All are welcome. Because we want your money. We want your fame. We want you to sit your butt in our pew so we can count you. What is wrong with that? You find even the pages of Solomon, uh, of Proverbs, telling us be separate. And yet he had a thousand wives and he separated and departed himself from God. Ought that not to be a lesson to us that we ought not to have the Egyptians, we ought not to have the Moabites, we ought not to have the Ammonites, we ought not to have all the strange people and women as Solomon had. You know, when we get in the church, we get envy. Well, you know, look at that church. They have all these people. Look at all the, all the kitties over at that church. It's amazing how one church has VBS and all the churches have VBS. And all the VBSs are worldly and ungodly. Well, they got more kids. They got more clowns out there. Get your eyes off. And get your eyes on the Lord and you'll do right. For their heart, the evil heart, studieth destruction. Now, the Christian is to study the Word of God, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly divine the Word of truth. There are wicked and evil people out there studying, studying how to be destructive. What are you doing fellowshipping with them? And their lips talk of mischief. They don't talk of holiness, they don't talk of righteousness. I mean, when you bring the world into your church, you you go to conversation. Well, this is the Lord. How Lord bless me this week. Well, can you please pray for me? I've got this issue. Uh, uh, you know, hey, you won't believe all the people I witnessed. When you bring the world and the evil people, it turns to hey, how's that ball game? You know, through wisdom is a house built. It. Now we got to get her. We got to get off. You know, the building. Because the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thy house shall be saved. Oh, so we got a church house and my house can go to heaven with me. No. It's the people. There's some Christian probably thing out there. Their church building is going to be in the clouds with them. Wisdom is what builds a house for God. Godly wisdom. And by understanding it established. Knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is how to apply what you know. And understanding is your relationship to God. If you have godly wisdom and godly understanding, you can build a house and establish the house for the Lord. Oh, you know, we're going to have that place we meet on Sunday morning only. Are you a husband, father? Are you a mother, wife? Are you children? Are they saved? That's your church. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. There is a seven-day church. 
that doesn't meet just on Sunday mornings and midweek service. There's a church of the family, if they're saved, that meets every single day and meets at the dinner table and meets at the, at the couch and meets before they all go to bed. You know, the, the pastors and the preachers go, oh, there's, you know, come to church Sunday morning. No, there's a church seven days a week. And if there's one in your household who is not saved, you need to gather to pray, you need to seek, you need to get the word of God, you need to saturate that lost person so they will come to Christ and know Jesus Christ. Oh, wait to Sunday morning. Have we not learned in 2020 that there may be no church building, there may be no church gathering? That the only church you may have would be the husband, father that's in charge of that house, to lead that house in the word of God. You know, we've had 2020 since March. We've had people sequestered. They had people who are stuck in their homes. They are uh, <clears throat> confined to their rooms. They're confined to their buildings. And since March, I wonder how many husbands and fathers have opened up the Bible. And led their family. I have opened the Bible. I have read the Bible. We have gone through the Bible. We pray together. We go through the Bible together since 2000. My family. Long before coronavirus. My family and I together served the Lord seven days. You got idiots and, and men and families, they don't even know what the Bible said. And the Bible says that a wife is to ask her husband, not the pastor. The father's in charge of the children, not the pastor. You only get church four hours a week if you're faithful. And outside the nonsense of, you know, the song service and the, uh, you know, the announcements and all the other garbage. You turn it to 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. It's your house. The house of God. They went from house to house, the book of Acts said. We're outside the building. We're talking about the people in your family. And by knowledge, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. Shall the chambers, the rooms of your house, be filled with precious and pleasant riches? Oh, the carnal man said, who gold, silver, who, who, hey, cars, and that ain't what we're talking about. We're not talking about banking accounts. We're not talking about stocks and bonds. We're talking pleasant riches of gold, silver, and precious stones in glory in heaven. When you do right. You see, we got to stop looking at the church as only one place where we meet. We got to start looking at the church as we're getting closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ coming. And we're in the light of the seeing church age. And if you've read Revelation chapter 3, it's not getting better. Jesus Christ is outside the door knocking on the church. Anybody can let me in. And the church in the light of the scene is not letting Jesus in. And yet you're going to send your wife, you're going to send your kids. No, it begins at home. It begins with a foundation inside your walls, inside your rooms. Imagine a husband, a father, a mother, and wife, and children standing before the Lord Jesus Christ with gold, silver, and precious stones, and earning crowns, and getting an inheritance. Imagine that family group, Jesus Christ, walking over and saying, well done. And the guy that has ballerina, that has baseball night, that has a man night, and it was just Sunday morning only, and Jesus would pay or stubble. A wise man is strong. You mean he don't have to lift weights? Yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. How? What have we been talking about? We've been talking about the Word of God. You can gain power 
and riches and strength by studying the Word of God. And you can go out there and tell people about Jesus and you'll be able to answer their question. Be able to debate with them. Though we don't debate, they'll debate with you. You'll be able to challenge their questions and their answers through the Word of God by working out, by studying to show thyself approved unto God. And you will not be made ashamed. And if you're made ashamed and you go home and you study and find out, okay, next one I get. Oh, I can't speak up for Jesus. I'm not good to talk and all that. But you pick up that stupid little baby. Yeah, you're talking to me. You do. How come you can talk on your phone, but you can't talk about Jesus? How come you can talk about the ball game? How come you can tell somebody, well, this is how you make chocolate cake. This is how I make my cousin uh, carrot cake. Oh, this is our plans. We're going to go to Mickey Ratland and all that. Oh, but I can't tell anybody about Jesus. Hey, what do you know? What's your wisdom? What's your strength? You know what the strength of Jesus Christ was? He had the word of God. He is the word of God. And he went to the cross and he suffered the, be the brutality that no human man could ever suffer. And he went there and he suffered and died. And before he died on that cross, he told a, a, a thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It is finished. When a man is, is drowning in his own bowels, when his fluids of his body are, are suffocating it, he can still, in the power of God, in the power of word of God, he can save a dying thief. And he can proclaim to us, it is finished. That's strength. That is strength that I don't know if this church age... In America, if we will have persecutions and all that, I don't know if we will go through the Fox's Book of Martyrs as we do today, but those people in Fox's Book of Martyrs, they had the strength, they had the power of knowing God. They had the power of being wise with God. They had the understanding of God. They had the Holy Spirit of God. That's why they can walk up to those faggots and sing Amazing Grace. They can sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. They can quote, Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil as the flames encircle their bodies. And the torture of the Catholic Church that now says all sodomites can now get married under the blessings of the Pope. Hallelujah! The priest can marry the altar boys now. Don't you tell me about marriage when you can't get married by your church rules. Why don't you shut up, Mr. Pope? Why don't you open up your Bible, Mr. Pope? Why don't you shut up, you Francis, you talk, talking donkey? Shut up. You don't know what the Bible says. You're going to tell us about marriage and you can't even control your own priest. You have no knowledge. You have no wisdom. You have no understanding of God. And yet the man with the Bible has all power to lead his family. The man with the Bible has all power to tell a lost man how not to go to hell. A, a saved man with his family can have the wisdom, the understanding, and the knowledge for God to say, Well done. This is a man that sinned against God. He got all gold and silver. He went back to Egypt. He married a thousand wives. He turned to other gods. And there's one thing we can learn about Solomon. How not to do. And churches have turned to their wives and other gods. And turned to their silver and their gold and their Egyptian goods. And ain't going to get you nothing. I, you know, Christians, I lift weights. I'm strong. No, you're not. Try 20, 30, 40, 50 years and see how strong you are. Verse 6. For by wise counsel, thou shalt make thy war. Wise concept. You get a group of men together saying, okay, this is the details. This is how many soldiers we got. And Jesus gave us the man that the ruler sits down. He said, okay, this is how many they got. This is how many we got. And, and this is our Navy. This is our army. This is how many horses. This is how many chariots. We look at, can we go to war and have the chances of winning a battle? And the Jehovah Witnesses sit there. 
we can't go into military service because we're against fighting. We're against killing. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. Solomon said with good counsel, thou shalt make war. When it comes to a draft, walk up to the Jehovah Witness and quote Proverbs 24, verse 6. We come to a council of the, the House of Representatives. We're going to get the President of the United States power to proclaim war and Jehovah Witnesses will be drafted with any other religions. I don't care. Thou shalt not kill. The Bible says, hey, we have good counsel to go to war. You just tell the Jehovah, it's not because thou shalt not kill, it's you're a coward. And you have not read the Bible. The Bible's not against wars. He said, got a good counsel? Go to war. When David said, the Bible says it was time that kings were to go to battle. David didn't go to battle, and he ended up with, with adultery, and he ended up with murder. And a multitude of counselors there is safety. You're going to do something. You're going to set your, your, your goal in life. I'm going to get a car. I'm going to get a house. I'm going to make this financial thing. I'm going to choose this career. I'm going to do this in my life. You better get one. You better get two. You better get three. You better get four. You better get five wise people and don't do what Rehoboam Solomon son did. He went to his high school graduation class and said, Class, what shall I do? You shall destroy the whole nation and split it into two. If you want to get in the field of medical, you go ask people who are in the medical field. You want to get in the field of automotive, get in the field where people are in automotive and ask them. I hope you got a pastor of your church is godly and in the Bible that you can ask him. I hope there are deacons in your church that are in the Bible, that are studying the Bible, that you can ask them, but they're far and few today. That's a shame. Good and godly counsel is not, it's not in the churches today. Because look what it says in verse 7. Wisdom is too high for a fool. I can't reach it, can't get it, can't get it. He opens not his mouth in the gate. That's where all the business is. That's where all the transactions are. That's where all the civil services, that's where all the licenses, all the certificates, all the business, all the judging, all the municipalities was handled at the gate. And that fool doesn't even have enough wisdom to, I got to say something. Oh, you're a fool. Shut up and sit down. If you did that today, you know, a fool will stand up in a courtroom today. I got rights. I'm going to sue. I'm going to get the ACLU. The Bible says, you're a fool. Sit down and shut up. We don't want to hear from you. Well, we need to say that. more. We need to tell the media. The media, you're a bunch of fools. Sit down and shut up. And if you're going to report something, you better back up what you report. You better nail down with what you report. We ought to start holding the media responsible for what they say and it better be documented by a paper trail that can be proved in a courtroom. Hey, the media said this. Let's bring in the court and let's see if the court will say that media story was true or not. But we got so many cases and the, the courts are overpowered with cases and cases. We couldn't do that. He that devises to do evil shall be called the mischievous person. Not in America, not in Europe. Man, he's put on television. He's put on The View. He's put on, you know, talk shows. He's given his moment of time. He's given the camera and all that. This guy, he wants to do bad. He wants to overthrow the country. He wants to kill a bunch of people. Let's go ask his mother. Oh, he's such a sweet little, great little child. Oh, he's just destructive and all that. Man, why don't we call the politicians who they are? They're mischievous. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
well, this candidate, that, they're all sinners. All have sinned. We need God back. We need Jesus Christ back. We don't need Republicans. We don't need Democrats. We need Jesus. We need the Bible. We need the gospel. That's what we need. And if you've got evil intentions, the Bible says that the world is to call you mischievous. Not give you a time of honor, not giving you praise, not giving you a medal. The thought of foolishness is sin. Oh! That moment you think, that's a foolish thought, it's a sin. When was the last time you and me, me and you, and I get foolish thoughts all the time. When was the last time that foolish thought? If we should confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did not Jesus say, every idle word man shall give an account of? There, if a man looketh upon a woman to lust after his heart, already committed adultery with it. What about our foolishness of, of our thoughts? Have we confessed them? The scorner is an abomination to men. No, they're not. But the, the Bible's true. Come preach on the streets. Come knock on doors. Come do something for Jesus Christ. And watch the people back up the scorner. Watch them defend the scorner that's against the gospel. We'll say, well, you know, then the Bible's wrong. The Bible's incorrect. The Bible has error. No, human nature is incorrect. Humans are against the Bible. The Bible's correct. Man is not correct. There was a time in America where there'd be street preachers going down the, the main broadways. There'd be street preachers going out in the field. There'd be street preachers going out in the mills. There would be street preachers that shut bars down, shut the theaters down. I guarantee there were scorners. But you know what the people said to the scorners? Hey, shut up. We want to hear the preacher. You know what people say today in 2020? Hey, shut the preacher up. We want to hear the scorner. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. That's you see how I don't I can't understand the Bible. That's why did you cave in? I didn't have enough strength. Look at verse 5 again. Wise man is strong. Why are Christians falling away? Why are Christians backsliding? Why are Christians in foul churches? Because they're not studying the word of God to show themselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. You think of any Christian that was in these, uh, oh, um, these cathedral churches, these mega churches, you figure if they would study the King James Bible, they would figure out something's wrong here. You know why the Pope doesn't want you in the Bible? Because if you get in the Bible, you would see who the Pope is. How do I not be deceived? Get your nose in Genesis to Revelation and read and study the entire King James Bible. And if you faint, you got to get in the word more. You got to build up more faith. You got to st stay strong in the Lord. It's not, you know, if thou faint the day of adversity, thy strength is small. It didn't say give up. It just says, you know what? You fainted because your strength is small. It didn't say, you know, all right, give up. It told you where you stood. What do you need? You need more strength. You need more power. You need more wisdom. You need more knowledge. You need more understanding. Build yourself up. He didn't say quit. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that be ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, I don't know, does not he that pondereth the hearts consider it? And he that keepeth the soul, does he not know? And shall 
and shall not he render to every man according to their works? You know what that verse is about? Someone's ready to die. And you don't deliver or try to deliver them. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. A man's about to be slain. If thou sayest, I know not, I don't know, I don't know how to answer him. I can't talk, I can't witness. He that keepeth the soul, that's God. Does he not know it? Shall he not render to every man according? If you cock out, if you give an excuse why you can't tell people about Jesus, why you cannot get them out of hell, why you cannot witness, why you cannot preach the gospel, why you can't tell them the hope, the blessed hope. You're going to be judged by your works. And listen, we're not saved by works. But when, when Paul says, hey, listen, all our works are going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And they're going to be tried by fire. Not our soul. And there'll be wood, hay, or stubble if you don't do what you're supposed to. You're not going to get gold, silver, and precious stone if you're not serving and doing what the Bible says. And you're not going to get a trophy just because you were on the team. That's worldly thinking. God is not going to give you a crown to say, well, everybody else has a crown, but not here's your... No, God ain't going to do that. And if you refuse to do what the Bible tells you today, you're going to get wood, hay, and stubble. And it's going to burn up. It's going to be ashes. It's going to be the heavenly smoke detectors. And you're not going to get a reward for what God has told you to do. And you can never say, well, I didn't know. You can get the Bible online. You can get the Bible. You can purchase a King James Bible online. You can probably maybe go to the bookstore and get a King James Bible. Well, my church is not King James. You can get a King James Bible today, 2020, and you can read the Bible yourself, and you can study the Bible. You can get the Holy Spirit to show you the Scripture. There is no excuse. And then when you're standing at the great white throne judgment, when the Bible says Revelation 21 or 22, all tears will be wiped away. All tears are wiped away after the great white throne judgment. When your friends and your family and your co-workers and people you come across, that checkout, uh, that cashier at this checkout center, you did not tell them about Jesus. You did not give them a gospel tract. I didn't know. I couldn't talk. Your hands are going to be covered with blood of their soul, and you're going to weep, and they're going to cast their teeth at you. That guy, my friend, my child, that co-worker never told me. And all lies are going to be on you. The one that has no crowns on his head. That's the one that did not tell me. He told me about baseball. He told me about CNN. He told me about the president. He told me, go vote. But he didn't tell me about Jesus. Your God's going to throw me in the lake of fire and you didn't say nothing. Friend. Jesus is Lord. No. I feel sorry for you that day. I feel sorry for you. I tell people when I preach at the farmer's market, if you're going to reject Jesus Christ, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, and Jesus, you're going to say, I didn't know Jesus. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I think that Jesus is going to say, Hayward family, yes, sir, yes, Lord. Step forward. All right, Stiley, Rachel, Tracy, come here. That guy said he was at the farmer's market. I, I think we've seen him, Lord. He says he's never heard about me. 
Angels in heaven, you want to play back every message that Stiley preached about me with that guy present. And then somehow it's going to happen. Every time I preached about Jesus, only about Jesus. That man's going to hear the gospel. That man's going to hear about Jesus. And Jesus is going to turn to that man and going to say, I thought you said you didn't know. That's my servant right there. He did well done. See those crowns? Now you're in trouble. Friend, you can't be getting out of the battle. You can't be ignorant. People are dying and going to hell. There are more people out there who tell you to go vote than go, go with the gospel. I tell people and I get them angry. I don't vote. I preach the gospel. And people got angry with it. And I lost friends. My son, eat thou honey. <laughs> Look at it. Now we just go. My son, eat thou honey. Because it is good. And honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. Honey is a natural. It's a natural sweetener. And it's good. There'll be other places we'll read about Proverbs that don't eat too much honey. When you're having a sugar attack with diabetes, and you don't take two tablespoons of honey. You're going to be sick. But he says, honey is good. So shall knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. As honey is good, as honey is sweet, so is knowledge of wisdom unto your soul, that eternal part of you. Solomon has turned to say, we've been talking about knowledge, we talk about wisdom, we talk about understanding. Son, you like honey? It tastes good, doesn't it? Mm -mm. Good. So is the knowledge to be thy soul when thou hast found it, the knowledge. Then there shall be a reward and the expectation shall not be cut off now let's run that back to verse number 11 and 12. When you have learned how to tell people about Jesus and how sweet Jesus is, and you can tell others, hey, I've got a bottle of Jesus here, man. He is sweet. He is great. Man, Jesus has blessed my life. Jesus saved my soul. Can I tell you about Jesus? Taste and see that Jesus is good. There's a reward. Well, they didn't believe. They didn't They didn't believe. They stayed. They never believed. You are told to go and preach the gospel. You are told to plant the seed. You are told to water the seed. You're not told to save them. I hate when people say, I got three people saved this weekend. You absolutely did not save their souls. If they saved you, they're not saved. God saved them. We just plant the seed. We just put the gospel out. We water the seed. God gives the increase. And God will reward us for our service. As an employer is to be rewarded the employee for doing their service. And it's likened to honey. You know, they're taking honey out of Egyptian tombs. They open that honey up and they say, it's still good. The gospel of Jesus Christ is 2,000 years old. You open it up and it still can save a sinner. Mm, it's still good. Jesus still saved. Lay not in wait, O wicked man. Against the dwelling of the righteous, spoil not his resting place. And the wicked will attack the righteous. The wicked man will try to get advantage of them. For the just man falleth seven times. Take that to your prosperity church and gospel 
Mr. Brightly Smirly Pearly Teeth with his yacht and airplane. The Bible says Christians fall. Did you get that? People say, well, Stalin, you wrote that on Facebook. Stalin, you said that. Stalin, you're down in the dumps. The Bible says you fall. Why are you so ignorant to see that, you know, a Christian falls down? You got love. You got greatness. You got crap. That's what you got. You don't know anything about war stories and the Christian on the battlefield and battlefield stories. They fall in the mud. They trip in the mud. They get hit by bullets. They get... A just man falls seven times. You will fall down in your Christianity. You will get your face in the mud. And any minister, any preacher, any teacher, everything's going to be hunky and great. Then why did Paul say, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? Why did Paul say, oh, I, 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 not only did I fast, but I was starving. I got enemies of the Gentiles. I got enemies of the Jews. I got enemies of the own church. I've got. You will fall. When you take a stand, you will fall. You know, you ever think about combat? And I'm not talking about modern combat. I'm talking about trench warfare. You know what the worst thing for a soldier to do during trench warfare? World War One, World War Two. To stand up in the battle. Get up in that trench and say, ah <laughs> And you're going to get a bullet in the heart. I'm reading a story about a revolutionary a soldier in battle. Today, and he said a man was walking across the field. And they saw him and they fired and they killed him. All he was doing was walking across. And yet God the Father tells his troops, stand and fight. And when you stand up against the world and you stand up against the devil, you're going to fall. And you will need to be taken to the first aid station. You will need to be taken to the hospital. You will need comfort. You will need to talk to your fellow soldiers. You will, because you're going to fall. It rises up again. There you go. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. If a wicked man causes a Christian to fall, he's going to get mischief. But that just man is going to get back up. And he may have a bandage. He may have a sling. He may have to carry a crutch. He may have to stay in the bed for a little bit longer. But he's going to get back up. And the wicked man will have to answer to that scar that he caused. Listen, Jesus said to Paul, Why persecute thou me? Every wound, every fall that Paul or Saul had for the Christians and the death of the Christians and imprisoning the Christians and putting handcuffs on the Christians, Jesus said, you did that to me. We get up. Now rejoice not when the enemy falleth. Ha ha. Hey, you got what you. No, no, that's not the golden rule. That's mean. And the Bible says we're not to rejoice when the enemy falleth. And let not thy heart be glad when he stumbleth. Least the Lord see it. And it displeases him. He turned away from his wrath from him, the, the wicked man. Oh. I caused that wicked man to fall. Because he's wicked. And you're going to sit there and laugh and shove it in his face. And you're going to act unchristianly. 
get up. Wipe it off. Get going, you wicked man. You, my child, I'm ashamed that you'd be acting like that. The, 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 they say it's the golden rule. Do unto others as others do unto you. That is a sin. Any testament. Matter of the Bible says that even Jesus says, if your enemy falls, your enemy, help him. Heap a bunch of coals on his head. If he thirsts, give him water. When the enemy's down, we don't kick him any further. And then when the Christian's down, Though we die, we don't stay down. We're absent from the body and present with the Lord. And if we're still in the battle, we just go to the first aid station, get our bandages, get washed up, get cleaned up, get healed up, and get back on the battle.